He challenged the Pharisees who were desirous of stoning the adulterers. Remember what he said to them? You who are without the first, you you who are without sin, let him cast the first stone. I don't think in any way this is an excuse for sinful behavior, even in others that we see. But I think God has teaches us valuable lessons. One of the valuable lessons God has taught me is that I have enough trouble dealing with the sin in my life to make it my job to deal with everybody else's. I think that's what Jesus was getting across to the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 7, he uses the same kind of language when he tells them, get the log, the beam, out of your own eye so you can see clearly to get the little speck of dust out of your neighbor's eye, your brother's eye. I think the point here is that we don't ignore the sin in others' lives. We are trying to help them get the speck out. But before we lift our noses in the air and proclaim innocency, we need to take a look, good, long, hard look into the recesses of our own hearts. We may not like what we see. And that's why we end up usually pointing out to other people <laughs> their faults. Well, Jesus uses another illustration. Here, in verse 2, he says, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Are you deciding that because they died, that was indication that you are better than them? That somehow you don't have the same sin as they do? And he answers with a tremendous statement. He says, I tell you, no. (laughs) Except ye repent. You shall all likewise perish. You're headed the same place. He gives another illustration in verse 4. And he says, or what about 18 individuals? There's a tower of Siloam that fell. There's no historical record of this, but there shouldn't be. I mean, this is a common occurrence. Accidents happen and people die throughout history. Not all of them are recorded in history. But it should not cause us to doubt the historical accuracy of the Bible, for this is a small incident, unlike the overthrow with Judas Galanitis. Most commentaries say that these people were probably bathers in the pool of Siloam, and there was a tower that was there that probably crashed. And I think that's interesting, because if that is true, is Jesus not showing another extreme example to them? You see, there might be perceived wrong that you could label upon those followers of Judas Galanitis, Judas of Galilee. But these people were the ones just hanging out at the pool of Siloam. Remember, that was the where Jesus had gone to heal the man because he was too weak to get into the pool. It was a place where God sent an angel down to stir the waters. People could get into that water and be healed. We're talking about people at Siloam now. These are not the same as these rebe- rebels in Galilee, these are innocent bystanders who a tower just happened to fall upon. So Jesus brings that to their minds and he says, Do you think they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? Everybody else were in Jerusalem where, the, where Siloam is. And then he says the same phrase again. I tell you nay, no. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. These two examples he uses teach a very important spiritual truth. So important that, friends, it is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. We'll get to that truth in a short period of time. But I want to get to the parable that Jesus uses, finally, to hammer the point home. This parable we read in in verses 6 through 9. For three years, the owner of the fig tree came to gather fruit. For three years, nothing was on the branches. He had planted it in his vineyard, which is not particularly unusual, by the way. They used to plant vineyards and figs in the same area because the vines could grow up on the fig trees as support. And they used much of the same technique, uh, they needed much the same care and soil content in order to do that. The stewards of the plants addresses the problem and suggests they cut it down and clear it out because it's useless. The vine dresser, the one who is in charge of it, the steward's the one who owns it, the one who's in charge of it, suggests they wait one more year. He'll take special care of the plant. He'll put manure around it. He'll aerate the ground around it. Then if it still is producing nothing, let's cut it down. I love the parables like this. They just, I love it when Jesus does it. Because that's it. <laughs> that's all he says. No explanation. Uh, the Hebrew word is nishmal. No nishmal. 
<clears throat> However, I think the explanation is found in the preceding verses. The explanation is found in the context. This parable has been very much allegorized and speculated on ever since the 4th century. Um, some have suggested that three years is the three revelations of God. God revealed himself to Abraham, to Moses, and now Christ. But there's actually no biblical support in the context for that. It's just kind of trying to make something up that's not there. Um, but very obviously in the context, this parable is directed to the Jewish people who were there. It is directed toward the crowds of Jewish listeners. Fig trees and vines are associated throughout the Old Testament with uh, peace and prosperity. Producing fig trees and vines are associated with peace and prosperity. And their absence was associated in the Old Testament with destruction and judgment. One individual says, Unproductive plants are frequent images of the unfaithful nation or individuals. Destruction of vines and fig trees is a metaphor for judgment. And there's many passages that back that up, Old Testament passages that I have. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea, Psalms, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, all talk about this idea of the figs being symbols of prosperity or judgment, depending on if they were there or not. It is obvious that he is directing the concept of judgment in the same illustrative way the Old Testament prophets did. There's a reason why Jesus chose to use the fig tree as his illustration here. The listeners would be able to get it. They'd, they'd say this. They'd, they're Jewish listeners. And all judgment, although judgment is not here, Jesus is saying, it will be. There is a last-ditch effort to make Israel productive, and then judgment, and then cutting it down. The three years indicates, I don't think, a specific amount of time, but except the expectation over time that was there, the long-suffering, and it was there, and to get plenty of opportunity. <clears throat> And although Jesus doesn't say it after the parable, I think the nishmal, the explanation, is clearly the same thing he said in verse 3 and verse 5. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I don't think the interpretation is complicated. It's not unusual, it's normal and clear. The fig tree is the people. The vine dresser is the Lord. The master is the father in judgment. There will be judgment on those who will not repent. But, this is the best part. 2 Peter 3.9 God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This specific parable is spoken to Israel as the fig tree. I believe, though, it can apply to all of humanity. And the message of Jesus to repent and believe the gospel is universal. It is not just one group of people. And I believe as well there are applications those that are Christians can gleam regarding the meaning of this parable. We're going to look at both of them and apply, allow the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. First of all, to the unsaved, there is the meaning of repentance. Jesus was speaking to crowds who followed him for meat and miracles, and few followed him because he was master. No doubt this very Jewish parable is meant to spur these listeners to repentance and faith in the gospel, the good news preached in the Old Testament. And now realized by the Messiah coming to die for their sins. We don't want to complicate this. The Old Testament prophecies were clear. We know that later Jesus was able to explain the entire gospel to two on the road to Emmaus from just the Old Testament. The message of repentance was preached in the Old Testament. The message of repentance was preached by John the Baptist before Christ was on the scene. The message of his re message was turn from something. Turn from your sin to the Messiah and look for him. He's coming. When Jesus preached repentance, he was preaching turn from sin and specifically he added this, your self-righteousness and turn to the Messiah himself in faith. And the apostles later preached this message of repentance. It was turned from idols to the Gentiles and turned from righteous legalism to the Jews to the Messiah, Jesus, who had come and died for our sins. And the message is still the same today. Friends, Turn from our sin and ourself and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and He will deliver us from our sins, from the very power of sin, from the penalty of sin, and one day from the very presence of sin. Repentance is not just an Old Testament concept. It is a necessary work of God. And He gives people the ability. He gives us the ability.